another edition of the Garage Apartment. I am the Funky Militant Kadar Jones. And as always, I got the tribe with me to let the people know who you are. It's hard about the music. Oh, I'm all middle. I mean, it should be the same order. D-Mac, back and better than ever. Yeah, it's a my. Absolutely, man. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out our website, thegarageapt.com. Um, man, of course, y'all know here at the Garage Department, man, we talk about a little bit of everything. We have been based, of course, we're based in sports and entertainment, but we don't shy away from anything. Um, so what we decided, man, we're going to do is we were starting a new series. We're going to call it I Am My Brother's Keeper. And how this came about was, all, all I can do is speak for me personally, and then, of course, I'm going to let you brothers explain. But with everything that is going on, with the unrest and everything that is going on, um, I was struggling pretty bad. And I was struggling deeply to find a proper, appropriate, and positive way to channel my, my rage, my outrage. And so one thing in the process of doing that, I noticed that I needed my brother. I needed somebody to talk to. I needed somebody to bounce ideas off of because, of course, I talked to my beautiful wife, but all we were doing was bouncing rays off of each other. And so I was like, well, let me reach out to some brothers. I know a ton of young brothers who are leaders in their community. Who, who, who contribute in different ways. And so I wanted to sit down and talk with you guys. Of course, the tribe and I, we, we got our own little show, but I got another young man, uh, his name is Sam Millis. He's a criminal defense attorney at the Millis Law Firm. Um, first off, welcome to the show, Sam. Uh, it's a pleasure being here with the tribe. <laughs> <laughs> Go way back, too. I know, I know. Absolutely, man, because like I said, it's a bunch of brothers. We know a bunch of brothers who are out here contributing. Uh, uh, we do go a ways back. But um, first, I want to really just pose to everybody how how the events, and not just the, the, the George Floyd events, but with the with the Aubrey, the Aubrey murder, with the Breonna Taylor murder, and just all of the... the, the, the the things that have led up to this point, led up to the unrest, how, how it has impacted you, and, and, and basically what is what is your plan going forward? Because I, I, I'm almost certain that everybody has been impacted to the point where they feel like they really, or they feel as though they got to do something. They got to contribute something to make this world better for the children that we that that we that we are all raising. So I guess I would pose it to I pose it to you first, Jamal, and we're just going to circle. Well, me being an educator, uh, and especially one of kids that are growing into themselves, being from puberty on to legal age. Uh, it really, it, it, it personally affects me because I work in a so-called low-income neighborhood or low-income district or part of the district. And these, this affects them directly because these, these were young men. These were men that were either their age, close to their age, or even around my age. Uh, George Floyd really hurts because he was from our neighborhood, my neighborhood, some place I scream all the time, no matter where I am, their award. And everybody, well, everybody in that area knew of him. Everybody knew him in the Houston area because he was in our subculture of music and even though he's he was a flawed man 
there was so much positivity that people loved about him regardless because he was just a human being. Same with Ahmad Aubrey. Same with everybody else who has been taken away from us. These are people. These are just humans. And to relay the message to young people that you are human, you do matter, uh, is very difficult because they see it, they become callous. And so they already think, well, I'm going to die anyway. I mean, I could always, we were all teenagers, and, yeah, we had that that mentality of, you know, we didn't know what we were going to do really, but we had a kind of reckless mentality, some of us. But uh, some more than just to, see it, just to see it now on other on people I try to affect, the people I try to to make think. You know what I'm saying? So, so their lives to be better, not for them. I mean, yes, I want them to be geniuses in their own right. I want them to be great in their own right. But I also want them just to critically think their way through things and to see. Them being us, well, them, us being taken away like we're trash is so difficult, A, for me to intake and to relay the message to them so they can make the make this world better, be better, better to society and make their community better, have just a sense of self a sense of bettering self and that's that's where i'm really coming coming with it because education is just not through a building education is through life as they say if you ain't learning you ain't living and right now they taking us away so we can't learn the only thing we are learning is they could take us away at any point and so that's where it affects me Okay. Um, well, I'm a little younger, so I um, it affected me strongly just from the sheer fact that I – it's truly amazing to see it. For It's not it's, – it's almost like it's not reality. And the way I look at it as is I understand the issue that occurred. To me, what's more baffling is the fact that people – refuse to actually see the issue and choose to go their own way. The polarization that's in this country for whatever the reason at this time is truly amazing. And me being the 35-year-old, I had to talk to my dad. I wouldn't talk to my dad. I was like, have you ever seen this? What is this like? You lived through the 60s. You were in Vietnam. And he was telling me that basically it's, Stuff like this happens on 20-year cycle. And so he's saying that this is something that he, has, he hasn't he has seen it like this since Vietnam. And that um, it is the fact that you can literally see a factual thing on a camera and two people can see it two entirely different ways based on your ideolo ideological preferences, based on how you were raised, based on your education level. And what's truly upsetting to me is that at 35, having lived that long, at 35, it is clear to me that there are certain people whose minds you won't change, even if they see things plain as day. Um, and that is truly upsetting. It's truly disappointing because... If we can't come together as one and have a conversation and agree on fact, then there's really no way to come together. Because if I go outside and say the sky is blue and you go outside and say the sky is purple, we can't have another conversation if we can't even agree on the fact that the sky is blue. So it, the way I feel about it is just the sheer fact that it's just, it's baffling to me how human beings think, how human beings think, and how they can see things in a manner that is not true or in a manner that is so skewed through their original prison. 
um, raising a two-year-old black man, um, black boy at this point, I am mainly concerned with educating him. And by education, I don't mean necessarily the book learning. Like Jamal was saying, education takes several different forms. Um, I need him to understand how life works here in America, the good, the bad, and the indifferent. I need him to understand how to capitalize on that, and I need him to understand how to come back and bring others up with him. And so at this point in time, my, like you were saying, what would I plan to do? My main plan is we have to find a way to reach those kids prior to prior to middle school, prior to the time they're getting to Gamal in high school, prior to the time they're getting to my wife in middle school. Because at that point in time, you've seen a lot of things. You've learned a lot of lessons, believe it or not, by 15 years old. And so what I have learned in my time being an educator, just living through life as well, is that you can instill things in kids at a young age, and those things they will bring with them throughout their life. Now, they might choose to rebel against some of those, which is their choice as human beings, and you just have to be there for that. But as long as you put in there the core values that are important, those will maintain them with their, themselves through their adulthood nine times out of ten. And I say nine times out of ten because that is the exact same reason we have the racism issues that we have because those things are instilled in these young people at a young age and then reinforced as they get old. And because of that, my main plan would be to simply, we have to get to these young kids first. We have to get to these young kids early. We have to stay on these young kids and let them know the right and wrongs and let them choose their path, and not judge them for their path, but continue to educate. So you chose to go this path, that's not the right path. You're not done, though. You're not in jail. You don't have a criminal record. We can still change things. You just need to change your path a little bit. And so that is what my plan is, is to figure out a way in which I can reach those kids at a younger age and truly instill the things that are very important to them and important to democracy as a as a whole. My last point would be, I feel that a major part of this is a lack of general education on all sides. And by that, I don't mean school learning once again. I mean just people don't learn. People don't read enough. People don't look into outside of their comfort zone. People don't take other people's opinions into account. And when you're only getting the information you agree with, all that is is reinforcing your thoughts. Those thoughts might be wrong. Those thoughts might be right, but they are simply reinforcing those thoughts. So like Lamar was saying, you have to be able to critically think and find, look through several different options in order to find the right answer. And so that's what my plan is, is to be able to educate these kids on how to critically think, how to find the right answers, and how to stay on the right path, because oftentimes you will stray. As long as you don't go too far, you can always come back. No, oh, I'm next? Okay. All right, well, um, I've felt all those feelings that everybody else imparted just now. Um, the thing that makes it difficult for me is I try to look at things uh, very pragmatically. I try to be practical. And you know, all the feelings are there, and you look at, okay, how can you attack it from a policy issue, right? How can you fix it in a pragmatic way? And unfortunately, I don't, it's about people's attitudes and people's fears <laughs> and uh, people's egos and power. Um, you know, I want to tell my son that there's something you can do to get out of a situation like that. But the truth is, if somebody want to kill you, they want, they want to kill you. If somebody wants to do harm to you, they want to do harm to you. Mm -hmm. So, so many feelings uh, are coming in there now. I think that there are some pragmatic things that could be done 
to stop certain types of police brutality. But at the end of the day, when it's you and that officer, and then if you saw that officer, how brazen he was, a lot of that was that dude's ego. That man should have never been a police officer in the first place. Or shouldn't have lasted that long, because you see he had a history of violence uh, against people and violating people's civil rights. You know, when you run into somebody like that, what do you tell your, your child? They can do everything right. They can comply. But it doesn't matter because that dude at that point wants to do harm to you. Still won't make it out. You still won't make it out. So I try to look at it that way. Um, you know, in addition to George Floyd, there have been several other. I mean, it's just been, I mean, there have been shootings uh, even in our own hometown. Six of them. Uh there's the, the, the sad situation of uh, Breonna Taylor, right? Um, you know, uh, and, and her situation is really just really bad police policy because I don't understand no knock warrants in the first place. Makes, makes no sense. Why? Sounds unlawful. You rush into somebody's house like that. I mean, geez, what do you expect, man? You, you caused that. Why can't you just stay outside? The person has to come out or something if you think they're in there. They even have the wrong house, though. Mm-hmm. Which is all the more reason not to do stupid, you know, just 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 bad, make bad decisions like that. Um, the thing is, how do you keep sociopaths off the police force <laughs> when they need people? And they're sociopaths, so by definition, they know how to pass tests and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, they know how to go through an interview and seem normal. You know. That's what a sociopath does. They get your trust and then they, you know, screw you over. So, I don't know, man. It's, it's very disheartening. And uh, the fact that, you know, it, it resonated so much with people because of the current situation with COVID and the lockdowns and just people being frustrated anyway, I think. Uh, there's a um, – I think there's outside people who – may not have our interest in mind, but they just want to tear things up too, uh, just for the hell of it. And, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's just, it's just a mess. Like Hadari said before we came on air about the fear, it's fear. And, you know, I, y'all know how I handle fear. I make fun of it, but it's, um, you know, it's a rough situation. You don't have any answers. You don't know what to say. I don't. That's what I got into with moving from now. Mr. Millage. Man, um, I kind of echo everybody's uh, sentiments that has gone thus far. Um, honestly, I really don't know what the answer is, which is sad. Ask someone who is a criminal defense attorney. I know my rights. I'm good at expressing what other people's rights are. I'm good at telling police officers when I have them on the stand what you can and what you can't do. I'm good at picking apart offense reports and and looking at evidence and saying, okay, somebody's lying. Okay, I'm good at all that, but the problem is that's in the courtroom. After it's already happened. Those rules, me telling you what you can and can't do, don't apply outside of the courtroom. I'm sure all of us, as professional men, (laughs) have been stopped, uh, and you instantly have this, this innate fear of, like, oh, shit. No one, excuse me. Oh, hell. Oh, are we allowed to use profanity on yeah, this? Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, like, I know I didn't do anything wrong, but I, I know I'm literally coming from court or I'm, I'm on my way back to my office from some little rural-ass town in East County uh, in, in East Texas, and I'm nervous because I know – you telling me to get out of my car when I know I haven't done anything wrong, I don't smoke, so you don't smell weed, I have a right to say, man, I'm not getting out of my car legally. 
That's what we say in theory. But in reality, I'd be a goddamn fool to sit there and try to, you know, show my intelligence and show that I know my rights because now I'm challenging your ego. I'm challenging your superiority. Okay? And that's scary. So I don't necessarily know the answer as far as... You know, I can tell you what your rights are, man. I, I, we could have us a whole sit down, you know, like, yo, they can't do this, they can't do that, they can't do this. Make sure you have your cameras. Make sure, you know, when the police come up to you, your phone's ready. I've received in the last 48 hours from Missouri County to Harris County six cases of either interference where people are just yelling at police, which is legal. It's no such <laughs> thing as interference. When you're just yelling at police, because guess what? The First Amendment trumps anything. And I hate using the word trump. But the First Amendment is <laughs> over anything that police officers are doing. You can say whatever you want. You can call his mama a cocksucker. You can do anything you want to. Yeah, you can to physically get in the way of them trying to make an arrest and perform a lawful duty. Okay? I've gotten obstruction cases, which are just absolutely ridiculous. I've <laughs> assault on a peace officer when you create the confrontation and when the guy t- uh, tries to, you know, like, yo, oh, stop. And it's on video. That's the sad part about it. It's on video. You're saying it. You hit him with assault on a peace officer. That's a third degree felony. Then you got trespassing. You know, because I told you to get on that side of the street, you didn't move fast enough, so that's trespassing. Like I say, man, like, There's so many issues that do go to policy, but I know me personally, I've changed my mindset. I told a story yesterday. I was doing an interview, and I told a story yesterday about when I was coming out of law school, you know, growing up in Greens Point, I've never wanted to be a cop. I've never wanted to be a DA because I just always felt like, man, that's public enemy number one. What the hell I look like? I'm not prosecuting folks. You know, like, come on now. Too many of us are being thrown away for some bullshit anyway. So, like, nah, I'm not trying to do that. But really, that was the wrong mindset. We need more black DAs. We need more officers, black officers, who are from certain communities that want to go back and police that community. You know, so that way you can establish that rapport with those people. You know, it's easier... I'd rather have, like, I got a problem right now, Cliff and Vincent, who's one of the best police officers at HPD, straight acres homes. As soon as he got out of there, he went right over there by the bricks, guard the city. That's where his main patrol was, because that's where he's from. Okay? I have another partner. If you see him, and I don't want to call his name out, because he does a lot of undercover stuff, you wouldn't think he's a police officer, but he's in the hood. Like, when he ain't undercover... You know who he is because he's not afraid. We can't have police officers that are afraid to patrol these neighborhoods that they send them to. Okay, that's a problem. Uh, and it's just so much other stuff. And I, I choose to one of the to answer the earlier question about what do you think? What steps can we take? I'm out here telling people and giving information. One of the biggest downfalls not just from a police brutality standpoint in the legal system, but the lack of information we have. Not because it's not out there, it just ain't nobody telling us. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a whole book of information from credit to all this type of shit that's been kept from us. But, for instance, serving on a grand jury. You know how easy it is to serve on a grand jury? All you got to do is Google a certain kind of grand jury and just sign up. A lot of us don't know that. We need to be on these grand juries. I'm preaching about jury duty. Man, show up the jury duty. You know what I'm saying? Hold these, cop, hold these cops accountable, you know, and get asked. But the other thing, too, and we will probably come to this, but I don't know if you paid attention to it, but I feel like the way to get people's attention to really make some change, hit their ass economically. One of the greatest resources we have as black men is just our DNA and our athletic prowess. It's being exploited by non-black schools because they need us for diversity, for numbers, type of stuff. 
now there seems to be this trend and this movement that a lot of these young top prospects are saying, look, I want to go to HBCUs. I guarantee if you shift that power, because one thing that brings this country together like none other is sports. Okay? If you take away that power, now all of a sudden watch how much black lives start to matter. Guarantee you start seeing some shit change. That, to me, that's the best answer I can give. We got to bone up on our information, get access to the information so we can have a seat at the table. And now we got to start hitting them where it hurts, in their pockets. Good segue to me. Absolutely. So now you just said something that, because that was going to be the very next question. You being an expert of the law, you being a criminal defense attorney, um, oftentimes, you know, one of the biggest arguments for the position that most people who are, are pro-police often say is compliance, compliance. And, of course, you should be compliant to what a police officer for. But what exactly are the rights of a civilian when interacting with a police officer? What do they have the right to refuse? What do what, what what orders must they be complying to, and how do you ensure the safety of all parties, not just the safety of the civilians, but the, the safety of the police officer? Because I mean, there are some good cops out here, and they do have a difficult task to perform. But as a civilian, who oftentimes is unarmed, and you're being approached by an aggressive officer who is armed, what are you allowed? To do? What are you allowed to do? How do you, what is your recommendation, recommendation for that situation? So, it, it, that's, a, that's, a, that's a loaded question, man. Um, <laughs> I mean, I know one right is to remain silent. Right. Yeah. And first when they a, lot of, a lot of times I instruct my clients to just shut the fuck up. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm I'm not talking about most of my clients aren't upstanding citizens like us who are you know hard <laughs> nine to five you know uh, they out there getting it, okay so my thing to them is hey man don't say shit you know yeah because that's the only more reason to shut the fuck up but I can deal with if you it. out there doing something yeah. <laughs> I can deal with it once it gets to court. Okay, but if you give them information to help you convict you, it, it's, it's difficult. But for us, the average hard working citizen, you have a right to ask the officer, Officer, what am I being stopped for? Okay, I always tell people, this is where you fuck a lot of officers up. Okay, well, officer, you told me that I'm being stopped for going 65 and 60. Uh, I, I was unaware that I was doing 65 and 60. May I get my ticket? Because this is a traffic stop, correct? Yes. Okay, so I'm free to leave. A lot of people don't understand you are, you are free to leave. Okay, now, in theory, in reality, you got to stay your ass there because <laughs> you're going to get an evading charge and it's going to escalate the situation. So what I do is I tell people all the time, and I especially tell all the women in my life, Immediately, turn your phones on. Turn your phones on so you can record what's going on. You know, call somebody on speakerphone if you have to so we can have a witness who's here, you know, uh, that's listening. But I always say, man, I always say as early as possible. Like you said, Adari, I mean, it's a stressful job. I get it. You know what I'm saying? Being a police officer is a very stressful job. It's a dangerous job, you know. You don't know if you're going to return home. But like I told one of my buddies, that's the law. I said, shit, I don't know if I'm going to return home. Right. You know, so I used to give you all that that card, but now, hell, we on the same playing field. I don't know if I'm going to return home. Uh, but the best thing to do, man, is just try to be as courteous as possible. Um, if you see an officer that you, you, you see is trying to take it to the next level, man, you know, at this point, just tell the officer, officer, I don't feel safe. I would prefer that you call a sergeant or something, call, you know, because we're not having good interaction. And I don't want this to go left. You know, again, I, and now what I'm telling people to do is make sure when the officer comes up to you, ask two questions. Do you have body cam? Is it on? Yeah. Please turn it on. 
Please turn it on because I, I I want this interaction recorded. Most but often, it be on. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but shouldn't it already be on? And thus, if yes. it's not on, then that's an original. That's a problem already, right? Which means they're yeah, probably not gonna turn it on. It should be on, but you'd be surprised, you See how many times either it's yeah, really. on, oh, the battery was low, which violates a lot of general orders. Okay, <laughs> um, but you'd be surprised. But I always tell people, ask them that. Hey, sir. You know, is this interaction being recorded? I, I feel comfortable if it if it can be recorded. I want to make sure because now you put them on notice. Hey man, I'm not letting anything go down that shouldn't go down. You know, uh, but here's the other thing too. I tell my kids that I coach, man, because I, I I coach AAU as y'all know, and I deal with 16, 17 year old. What we would see as boys, but society sees as men, because these are six eight, six nine, six six. These ain't no little kids. I'm a baby. Okay. Your job is to make it from point A to point B, and a lot of times point B and back to point A, being home. You know. Um, there was something else I was gonna say, and I, I lost my train of thought because I, I started talking about that because I just added that into you know, a talk that I've been giving about making sure you ask those two questions. Um, and I know I'm veering off, but you talked about the Breonna Taylor thing and how they went to the wrong house and why no not warrants. How is that possible? We've been fighting for no not warrants to be deemed unconstitutional. And this is another thing, too, that I tell people, man, voting is so important, not just every four years, but every two years. Yep. Mm -hmm. Love okay. The local elections where you make the most impact because those are your people that are actually shaping your state law. Those are the people that, you know, directly right, right, deciding like, do you know, most southern states within the last two years just got rid of an old ass law that prevented blacks and whites from marrying. Literally, I think Alabama just got rid of theirs like five years ago. Right. Texas just got rid of theirs, and it was literally on the ballot <laughs> to repeal it. I want to say, like, was it 2012? And I was just flabbergasted. I was like, God damn. Like, we actually having to vote on repealing this shit? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but people don't get excited about the two-year election when we should. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, we should be more excited about that. Yeah, yeah. But it's more local. It affects you more. I, I tell you, the the thing that bothers me about the Breonna Taylor matter is if it did not happen around Ahmaud Arbery and around George Floyd, we would not have that. Now, it's interesting because compare that to about a year ago, we had a similar situation here in Houston. Where yeah, they, oh, they, they, were, they didn't look like us. They went mm -hmm. to the they went to the wrong house, and it was just based off bad information from the very get-go by Officer, Officer Goins, better known around the hood as Batman, been falsifying shit for years. Okay? The sad part about it, and this brings me to another point, he was a bad apple that was known throughout, but steadily was getting promoted through the ranks and was training other people how to be bad apples. Nobody... And it's such a culture. And if you talk to law enforcement guys, they'll tell you, man, it's such a culture. It's like, it's like pledging. Like you can't say nothing crazy, say nothing. you know, or else you're gonna get blackballed. You know, mm -hmm. you're gonna get, you know, excluded from getting those promotions. So they just kind of turn a blind eye, like, all right, man, like, you know, <laughs> hey, dude, you might want to chill out, you know. But they allow that type of culture to persist. And that goes on all throughout the United States. It ain't. It just bothers me because that shit made national news, not because, in my opinion, because they killed somebody and they were white. They went to the wrong house. They had bad information. Turned out there was never a CI, and it just blew up. But the reason why Breonna Taylor stuff is being heard is because the young lady died. I think she was law enforcement. She was a nurse. She was, she was, she was, she was a nurse. nurse. Oh, she was a nurse. That's right. I knew it was yeah, something. She, she, she's like, an emergency nurse. Right. She's a nurse. You don't kill this lady. But we didn't know nothing about it until all this stuff came you out. Worry, they yeah. not, they closed the investigation. Now they're just not reopening the shit. You know, like, it's crazy to me. So, 
I don't know, man. It's, I know I covered a lot. I'm sorry about that, Adar. I kind of jumped around, but I hope I answered your question, you know, as best as I could. You did as best as you could. Yeah. Absolutely. And and so it actually makes me so now just like with language in your so as frustrated as you are, because you you know again, you know the law and you work it from the inside. What needs to be done? I mean, of course, I know that it's because it is systemic and because there are right, you gotta start. Many obstacles. Where we as the we as the, 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 the citizens of an area, where can we support those lawmakers to get in there and make a change? Of course, I know the voting booth, of course. But with the current lawmakers that we have now, what is it that we have to do in order to make sure that these changes are made now? Interestingly, and I hate to say this, and like you said, vote, vote their ass out, and it's also finding the right lobbyists, finding yeah, money, was, and, and donating so we Donate. can money talk bullshit walks. You want things passed? There's a reason why the NRA is still as strong as they are. Mm-hmm. It makes no damn sense why a, a regular person can go buy an automatic rifle, a goddamn war weapon, and just have. It makes no sense. And then be out there patrolling the streets. Right. You don't use that shit for honey. You don't use it for any other purpose other than war. Well, you but can show up to the protest with it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Storm you the can show up with it. Certain, certain with people can show up to the protest. Right, 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 right. right. Well, well, you know. If yeah. you were quite that lit, you can show up too. You know, so Man. You, you, Man, you, definitely, you definitely got to get with the lobbyists, but also, too, from a local standpoint, man, we got to start holding some of these public officials accountable. For instance, I know they tried to start a citizen's review board, okay, working in conjunction with the DA's office. Well, the current DA shot that shit down. The previous DA, who was a Republican, was listening, but I think it wasn't, you know, genuine. I think she was more so thinking like, okay, I need to try to win some votes. But and the current DA would be who? Kim Ock. Kimberly Ock. Okay. Kim Ock has weed on. Call him out. Kim Kim has been disappointing. She has been disappointing. I had such high hopes. But I think she learned quickly and unfortunately this is a political job. So a lot of things that I think she wanted to do, she understood or so she learned like, well shit, I can't do that because, you know, I've yeah. made so many promises to people who financially contributed. You know what I'm saying? Like I you know, like case in point with those cases I'm talking about, Kim knows these are bullshit cases, but she's in a piston match with Art Acevedo. Now, Acevedo is winning the media as of lately. He actually came out. Him and Bill O'Brien probably done the best 180s in the last <laughs> two hours. You know, they look good. They sounded good to me. But me, being on the inside, I'm like, man, Acevedo, Acevedo has been a media whore. Okay. Uh, then why you know, that the for the last time, man? Yeah, you, you know, but you know, she can't just dismiss these cases because it's gonna look bad and that's gonna give more fuel to Acevedo to say, hey, the reason why crime is so high and we can't drug exactly. is because DAs aren't prosecuting cases. And then he's already said it three times. You know, so but you gotta start holding these people accountable and be like, look. We need these police officers that are engaging in this bad behavior to be treated like normal civilians. We don't give a damn about that shield. They should not be given qualified immunity. And actually, there's legislation that's trying to be passed now to take away that qualified immunity. So, you know, one, one, real quick, Sam. So, but is it not, from what I'm hearing on the news and things like that, is that it is kind of built into the law that cops get the benefit of the doubt or that they have, should I say, extra leniency in how they perform their job? Is it built into the law or is it just built into the minds of the people on the jury that says, well, he's a cop, he was going through this, so I have to give him a little leeway in how he performs his job. Even though I know it's kind of abusive how he did it, he was still trying to make it home and thus he felt this was the only way to do it. I, I think it's a, a combination of both. And here's why I say that. Because generally, 
You don't have qualified immunity, and by qualified immunity, I'm speaking of the 11th Amendment, sovereign immunity, okay? Because they work for a municipality, that is considered to be, you know, part attached to the sovereign immunity because that municipality is part of the state. You can't just go around suing states. But that's on the civil side. When you charge criminally, ain't no qualified immunity. Ain't no sovereign immunity, okay? But that's where that second part comes in. You're trained to give a police officer, as little kids, police officers are good. They never lie. They never do anything wrong. They're the beacon of our community and all this type of shit. So if it comes down to a credibility between the Arthur McGowan and Officer Dickhead, they probably going to give it to, you know, like, well, you know, maybe, you know, Maybe he should have been as lippy. Maybe he should have just complied. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's just how it is. So you do have to battle against that. That's what the uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison was saying yesterday. It was like, look, it's an uphill battle because a lot of juries, jurors, is having their mind. It's just something that's ingrained. Like, it's just a natural bias in favor of police. Like, which is. You, that's why the George Floyd is hitting so hard, in my opinion, because you could literally see him for nine minutes where he was not pushing back. He was not, well, not nine minutes, let's say when he was on the ground, but not pushing back, not doing anything, and yet it still turned out the same way. Uh, and that now that's a sad reality. Like I said, when the question was asked about how do we comply, I don't know. I mean, I've literally seen not just George Floyd, but I've seen countless others comply. And for instance, let's let's go back. What was that? A year, year and a half ago, Philando Castile in the same goddamn. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Same. Told him he had his license. Told him he had his license. Was very articulate. Very, you know, pulling out his license. You know, officer, I'm I, I have a concealed handgun license. I'm I'm showing you which is the law. You're supposed to tell officers yeah. hey, I have a concealed handgun license. He did everything he was supposed to do. Did they everything got. right. Okay, and still ended up getting shot because we had a guy that was just afraid and naturally fearful. I was gonna say he just he was still shaking. I, I, I think here's the thing too, and I want you all to be prepared for it. I don't see how there's any way that they don't get a conviction, especially on Derek Chauvin, the new yeah. officer. I don't see how they don't get a, a, a conviction for him. But I wouldn't be surprised if they if they did. Oh, I'm 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 totally America shouldn't be surprised, but America better be prepared for what's gonna happen if they don't get a conviction. I I wouldn't be surprised but you know again at the end of the day it is <laughs> it's likely, but uh, no, nah, man. We, we, I really do think they need to have a separate entity that is not involved with law enforcement. You know, maybe former police officers, uh, you know, citizens, you know, lawyers, or something. You know, to serve as like an independent review board to be like, okay, hey, sound these, like a president tried to start that. You said what? So it sounds like a president tried to start something like that. President who? Not this fellow? Obama? No. No, Obama. Oh, yeah, he did. The 21st he did. century. Yeah, he, he did, but the problem is he got... This is the minimal. And it's an executive order. You can't do that type of stuff. So, but locally, you can. And what yeah. I would want to happen is for us to say, hey, we need an independent review board, basically an independent grand jury, that says, okay, we find probable cause, let's push this forward. Okay, yeah. Let's push this forward. That process, that, that process, that has to be voted upon or that has to be approved a, a, a no, in a If I'm not mistaken, Bottoms did that in Atlanta, right? I don't know. I don't know. I have, she was talking about how she was going to pick up that whole thing again because Trump stopped the 21st century, but she liked it and she, had, she says that there needs to be a civilian yeah, see, but there's things like that that exist, but <laughs> they don't have any power. <laughs> there's a Citizens Review Board at HPD, but what power do they have? They don't have subpoena power. I was going to say, they don't have subpoena power. They don't, don't have any power. They can't do anything. They review they, things. Yeah, all they can do is just get, get notes and Recommend. review. They don't have any investigative power. 
Well, and, and then if that's the case, because it is citizens and maybe you're saying that they're not legally trained or whatnot and there's nobody guiding them, then maybe you need to have nothing but people that have legal backgrounds sitting on this board that do that are active practitioners, you know, that are able to do that. You, know, to you have to give the power. board some power, though, is the thing. You right. have to get – something has to be written into the law where, yes, you have – this board – has subpoena power or not even subpoena power. This board just gets shared information just because they're this board the same way any other law enforcement agency would. Give them yeah. law enforcement power is what you need to give them. I, I don't even know if it has to be a state law. It could be a local thing. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not going to sit up here and try to act like I know. I, I don't know how that process would go. Uh, but I do believe that is the answer to holding people accountable. That's all I want. Accountability. I, I, I think that's what everybody wants. It's right. too many times that, like I told somebody, I was like, man, I represent people from homicides to drugs, okay, right. to little misdemeanor ass assaults, to little trespassing, whatever. I've seen people get arrested just because so-and-so said he might have been there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it took them damn near a whole week to arrest this man. Okay. Yeah. Not only that, then the autopsy comes out in less than a week. I ain't never seen no shit. Never seen this <laughs> And then you lie. Right. Then it was a half ass autopsy. I was like, oh my yeah. God. Like, it's, this is a bad dream happening. But I, I, I just, we just want accountability, man. Like, because too many people get arrested and for less stuff where the evidence isn't, like you say, in your face, where everybody sees it. I don't know how you can have a different opinion about what you saw. Like, it's there. <laughs> There's no justification for that. There's no, well, what did he do before? Or, well, you know, he should have complied. Or, you know, like, exactly. we, didn't, we didn't see all the film. We didn't see all the video. No, no, yeah. you have to try hard to disagree. <laughs> yeah. You have to try real damn hard. What did he do to provoke <laughs> What did he do to provoke this? Yeah, your girl Candace Owens. You got to be like that. You got to be delusional. Man, I'm not. Man, I'm not. Yeah, yeah, that's the reason how I got to no, 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 don't you do that. I want to hear your opinion on Candace Owens. No, not on Candace Owens. You be in some time. I wrote a whole dissertation on her, on, her, on her video, man. You have to be absolutely delusional. Man, so, on, Amad, let me ask you, let me ask you, Amad, about we're in Houston, Texas right now. Mm. The news is talking about there have been six police officer involved shootings. Y'all were talking about it earlier since April. Nothing has been released. Body cam footage will not be released. It's shown a few families their own footage, not shown other people's footage. Nobody held accountable from what the public knows. Mm -hmm. So, I, I saw guess... One footage. I'm sorry. I saw one footage. Was that an old footage where, I guess, kid was in the middle of the street and just got gunned down? Was that the one that had the piece of rebar? I don't know. He just he was in the middle of the street, hands up and everything, and they just smoked him like he was a horse. Yeah, is that the dude that got shot over the horse, looking for his horse? I I don't know what it was. I just saw the part where they were. It was it was from outside witnesses on the cell phone. Dude was in the middle of the street, hands was up. They shot him once or a few times. He was on his knees, and then they finished him off. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering how 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 often does that type of thing, that type of stuff occur? And uh, I guess for Sam, what would be the next step in that case? How can you legally get that released, or how can we politically put pressure to get that released, or how can we? Um, socially, put pressure to get that release. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'll ask Amaya. Cool. Amaya, you can ask first because I don't. I, you might have a little more facts I mean, can, on it or anything like can that. Can anybody? Can anybody ask for it to be released? Because I know a lot well, of. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but but, but see, okay. A lot, of, yeah, no, 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 no. a lot of footage released just on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, but okay, it's Texas Public Information Act, man, and it's still. He's not released. It's still an open case, okay? Now, I know one of them, the one with the gospel singer, the family asked him not to, 
right? They got yeah. the and they asked him not to release it. But on the cool, I mean, as far as like an open records request, like for a subpoena or something, yeah, they have to release it because that's a court order. But for like an open records request, <laughs> the thing, it's still an open case. So Sam so, is my defense attorney would not be able to file papers and get oh, yes, that well, release no, to the no. public. Sam I would have to subpoena power. He could subpoena it. Mm-hmm. He could subpoena it, but as far as making an open records request, there no. I couldn't go in there and just do it. Okay. No. Now after some now after someone has either been arrested and charged or the charges have been dismissed or whatever, then you can go and do an open records request as like a media outlet or whatnot. But yeah. So how long can the cases remain up? Well, Shit. Shit, it's cold cases yeah. from the sixties. Exactly. <laughs> you can make it so it would never come out. You yeah, can. but murder has no no statute of limitation. No, it doesn't. But I mean, nobody's been charged with murder. Yeah, or will probably. Well, yeah, in, in, in what we're talking about, yeah, yeah. But no, nah, I mean, there's open shit. You can leave a case open as long as you want. <laughs> as long so as you don't, so your, your one redress would be to subpoena that information for the client. Yeah, that's it, though. But that's only going to be played in the court. But see, now we got to keep in mind there are two arenas that you possibly can be playing in. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I don't want to I don't want to confuse. You got the civil arena right. where I would be the I would be the plaintiff's attorney because we're trying to sue the city of Houston. We're trying to sue Houston Police Department and the individual police officer. Right. right. So in a case like that, where I'm representing the family for a wrongful death. Then I am subpoenaing all body cam. Mm-hmm. I want to see that. Now, I'm sure the judge may say, okay, I'm going to put a gag order on it uh, so that it can be released and we can, you know, uh, you know, uh, looks at it in camera and says, hey, it's too graphic, plus we don't want to spoil potential jurors, you know, by releasing this information. Okay? Which I could understand that, all right? Uh, but then you have the criminal side where if I'm representing the officer, okay, then it's not up to me whether or not it gets released. It's probably going to be up to the DA's office and, and the judge. And the DA and the judge are probably going to say that this should not be leaked to any media outlets because there's an ongoing case. There's an active case going, and again, we don't want to run the risk of tainting any potential jurors by seeing this, by inflaming them and possibly prejudicing them. So, um, if they, does that make sense? What I'm saying? Yeah, mm-hmm. very much so. So, you know, but now if I'm if I'm representing the family, I probably would try to be slick and and, and you know, if I had dash cam, like uh, I'm sorry, not dash cam, but c- cell phones. Hell yeah, I'm releasing it to the media because I want people to be upset. Mm-hmm. So that way, now I'm forcing you. We ain't going to trial. You might have to pay me a shitload of money. Right. You know, so because it's out there, there's no way you can win. That's what makes the phone so important, man. Like the smartphone is the greatest thing that ever happened to us. Greatest thing ever. <laughs> greatest thing that ever happened to us. You know, um, that. You know, you ask uh, how common is this? You know, the shootings aren't as common, especially like you know, I mean. It, it's bad stuff in this city, but it's not as common as it is in a lot of other places. But there's a lot of other things that are very common. There's a lot. There's a lot of things that are very common. Just the face-to-face brutality and all that type of stuff. That and just the disrespect with the camera you have in your own recording device That's comes into play. Disrespect. Because I was, I can remember being 12, seeing my homeboy across the street from where his brother was getting arrested. Cussing out the cops, like you say, you got the right to do, but cussing out the cops, dude. The cop came over there and whooped my homeboy's ass for five minutes mm-hmm. just because he was talking shit. Said, I could arrest you, but I'm going to leave you here on the ground and went back and arrested his brother. And the dude couldn't do nothing. And to this day, he's like, F the police for that, which makes sense, you know what I'm saying? But he's also not the most substantive citizen anymore, so. <laughs> But so I can I can understand that it's just so. So would you say that they basically have too much power from the get go? 
We are instilling in the in our kids too much promise in police, not just us being men, black men, us talking. Just in general, America puts entirely too much weight in the police. But without the police, you couldn't really have the same democracy you have, right? Uh, and that's what I was going to say. I, I want to be careful by saying that we put too much power in them. I think instead of saying we put too much power in them, it goes back to the word of the night. We don't there's not enough accountability. Let me get this one afterwards, yeah. We, 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 we let them, we give them passes too much. It's not power. They need all the power they can to enforce the laws, okay? Otherwise, without police, you know, yeah. it, it'll be very more and more fell. It'll be wild out here. And you yeah. need police. You see a mod out there. Yeah, 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 exactly. You have posse. Right. And that's why I told, I tell people that be on that, man, fuck 12, all that. Okay. Get the shit kicked in. That's gonna be first thing you call. Uh, you yeah, know, that's right. all you got. Right, but I I do believe that I I don't know the right terminology. I don't want to say we we're giving them too much power, but but we've also given them a little bit too much of our rights too, due to you know the little stuff like nine eleven when they start passing Patriot Acts and stuff like that where they can. Literally infringe a little bit on our on our right seizing your property. Yeah. It's, only, it's only gonna get worse based on yeah, some man. Supreme Court stuff that's come out. The Fourth Amendment is shrinking as we know it. I mean, my God, and that's why again it goes back to that basic premise of voting, man. Like now, I just talked about the two year thing, but this next presidential election is important because Dude. that poll poll Ruth Bader Ginsburg is holding on literally. <laughs> She has yeah, they she, gotta have her life support. They need to have her life support. Her life support. She, she, she's standing alive with the, with the ventilators and the oxygen yeah. mask and everything. She's time. willing herself to stay alive. She she refuses to let this man appoint another, another one that is just has no respect for the the average citizen. I mean, it's 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 getting wild, man. Now. Uh, what was the latest decision that came down about uh, traffic stops? That basically, an officer doesn't even, if an officer has a hunch, he can just pull you over. Now he doesn't even have to justify with an objective traffic. Stop. Probably because of nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like, come on, man. Like, that's that's scary. Yeah, that's opening the floodgates. Me, no, I, I, I think that. Uh, a lot of things about policing could be done a lot better. And there's places in the world where they do it better. Uh, yeah. That we should uh, maybe uh, implement some of those things. Uh, first and foremost, I think it's too too easy. I hate to say it like that, but to be a police officer. To become a police officer. Yep. In Japan, you have to have a four-year degree. And they want you to have a course of study in police science. And a lot of people say that Japan has the best police force in the world. I don't know how they judge that, but I've heard that. Um, I guess you know, because crime statistics? Yeah, and, 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 and just how happy people are with the police there. Um, you know, I mean, certain big cities have certain standards, you know, just like anywhere else, you know. But, I mean, just to become a county sheriff and some county in West Texas, like, what's the qualifications for that? You know, uh, what kind of academy? Good. What kind of academy do you have to go through? Do you go through a, a, a re, I mean, a, and in the academy, six months. Like, you should have to six train months. two, two years of classroom study. I think at least, I mean, before you even get put out on the street, you get put out on the street in six months. You, you know, said, and then you, hmm? you you said something, man. That's something that I've complained about a lot. And you know, obviously, the highest law enforcement in the state is the state troopers. Generally, right for the most part, you know, most state troopers have degrees. They have college degrees, full four, four year college degrees. Okay. Uh, then I would say HPD Harris County Sheriff is the same because I think you have to have what sixty hours. 
Well, yeah, yeah, 48. Two years, I think. Oh, it's 48? Okay. My bad. 48. You got to have 48. But you now it's just like... You enough for an associate. Well, but it's so hard now, to yeah, get recruits in. What, now when she starts talking what? about the constables... Yeah. Come on now. You start talking about... Constables. Well, a lot of guys start off. Yeah, well, a lot of guys start off as constables. And then, you know, apply with someone like HPD or something and, you know, go lateral. So... A lot of guys get their start there, and that's how they, you know, don't have to have the college time or any of that. But but the thing that bothers me about that, right, I was going to say, that that bothers me. And then you have guys like out in Montgomery County, and then some of these little rural-ass towns, man, all you got to have is a high school diploma. I mean, that shit is awful. I mean, it is freaking awful. Uh, and you know these officers don't know their ass from a hole in the ground. Once you start talking to them on the stand, it's just like, man, come on. Um, I also think, too, one of the things that should change is I find it very interesting that there are a lot of officers who have baggage, disciplinary issues from previous stops. Yeah. They're able to still get a job in law enforcement in just another county. Like, that is amazing to me. Or they get fired about the one and get their job back. You said what? I say, or they get fired and the arbitrator gives them their job back. How long do they have to arbitrate for the job? That I don't know. Hmm. But I know a lot of guys get fired from certain police departments, and then they go to the union, they go to arbitration, and they get their jobs back and their time. Hmm. I remember I heard about one guy who was only on the force for three years and had 300 aggressive uh, internal affairs investigations against him. 300 in three years. That's and another thing, too. I'm glad, has you, a job. I'm glad you brought that up. I think the internal affairs ordeal for citizens to complain is designed to frustrate you from going through, from following through with the process. As a person that's filed two complaints just this last year, because I've had two issues. I know I had an issue where I was trying to visit my client, and this Captain Angela Adonis said that uh, I couldn't go back and see my client because. I didn't have, like, my, my uh, I lost my license. I had left my license up in Canada, and I left, I forgot my passport at home, but I had my frequent visitor badge. I also had my bar card. I had my driver's license. Everything was up to date. She said that, I'm sorry, I didn't have my driver's license, but she was like, ah, oh, you can't go back. And I'm like, hey, I'm a lawyer. I'm an officer of the court. She told me that, you know, we don't let uh, the inmates associated with, criminals, and I was like, excuse me? What? And me and my criminal background and just all sorts of stuff. So I filed a complaint against her. That still hadn't been resolved. They sent me a letter about two weeks ago, misspelled my name and everything. It was just a damn <laughs> Wanted you to fill out a polygraph. Wants you to take a polygraph examination. I said, no, why, why am I taking a polygraph examination? I want to know about my spouse's and employment and who she works with, how much she makes. I'm like, what does any of that have to do with my complaint. So they can set up harassment? You know what I'm saying? So I think that process is a joke and needs to be changed to really give people a true chance at, at you know, filing this grievance. And also, it shouldn't be so secretive. Like, hey, I filed a grievance. I'm the damn plaintiff. I need to know what's going on in this case. You know, like, I have no idea. When I call, I'm like, yeah, like, I'm calling on case number this. What's going on? Oh, we'll give you an update. Like, I, I, I don't like that shit. And, again, it's just, to me, promoting bad police work and saying it's okay. And that, that goes back to the accountability. You know, so we got a ways to go, gentlemen. Absolutely. And I, I want to switch gears a little bit. And, Sam, I'm going to pose this question to you and then the rest of you fellas, y'all can go ahead and respond. How much, um, how much of a role does public opinion or does the social, uh, the social outrage play in getting these decisions done? The reason I ask that is because yeah, I'm watching the the, the protests, and don't get me wrong, I, I I I understand the protests, I understand that's that's the lane for some people. But I I'm the type that to, to, in, in my in, that's my opinion in my opinion. That's symbolism. 
And in all actuality, symbolism doesn't really get much done. It's about actionable uh, matter. You know, somebody actually going out there and, and, and doing something, doing something of action and making something happen. How much of a role does the social response play in getting policy done? So we've been protesting for years, and these things are still out here happening, and they've still been able to get away with them. So how much does social response play? How much of a role does it play? I think it plays a huge role. I think it plays a huge role, and I want to say something. Yeah, we have been protesting for years, but this is the first time in our lifetime that I could say they have been protesting with us. And I think now that there are others who are outraged and like, hey, enough is enough, and you count, you couple that with the fact that motherfuckers were tearing up shit. Okay, now it's like, hey, something needs to be done. So what happened? You got an arrest. Okay. Then all of a sudden, you know, they took the other dude off the case. They took the cops off the. They turned the investigating it and brought in the right. DA. Hey. Brought, brought in the AGs. We should have happened from the get go. Anyway, yeah, very uh, much so. So I believe things happened with the Amar Arbery. The fact that people saw the video were upset about it, and it spread like wildfire. Keep in mind, this shit happened in January. January, mm-hmm. February. We didn't learn about it until what? May. April, April. Yeah. So, right. We and so again, they were trying to keep that on the hush. So I believe that the the, the the social pressure, you know, does force action. Now, I tend to agree with you. I think if the protests and the marching, which I took part in, and it was a beautiful thing, but if we don't follow that up with more action, like voting, like keeping the pressure on and demanding, and I hate to say it, tearing shit up, hey. Because, again, when you try to peacefully protest, you got your Drew Breeses of the world. You know, like that's distracting the narrative. So the only way to get people's attention sometimes, I, we got kids. You know, you, what happens when a child don't do, you know, want your attention? What they start doing? You try to ignore them. They cut the goddamn oh, wow. <laughs> And what do you do? Okay, okay, hey, 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 all right, let's let's try to work this out. So, you know, it's not just symbolism. And again, like I say, yes, we have been protesting for decades. Y'all's grandfather protested, okay, led, led a lot of, you know, changes. He was, shit, he know about the Houston riots. He exactly, I was going to say, he probably led one of the most important protests. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And, and look where we are, still getting treated a certain way. Civil rights, all them folks, March on Washington. Man, we had the, the Million Man March. You know, the only thing I can see that came from the Million Man March, and I've told people this, was we got President Obama, which I'm grateful for. But other than that, you know, like, we ain't really got nothing. But again, we have to follow up with action, and again, we have more people that have come to the fight, more people that have the power to influence the, the, the people that need to be influenced. I would say I would have to disagree with you as well, Adora, on the fact that it's just the symbolism because, I mean, it is not the end-all, be-all, but the social pressure, the social unrest is the only way to get their eyes on the problem. Because otherwise, they will stay in their bubble. They will stay watching whatever they're watching, reading whatever they're watching, and they won't really even be exposed to it. If they are exposed to it, they're exposed to it on a smaller level. But when there is civil unrest, as they call it, it brings the whole world into it. If if you're watching TV, you can watch a sports show. You can watch a news show. You can watch a cooking show. You can watch a fashion show. And they are all discussing the same thing. And that is simply because of the civil unrest and the civil, the, the fact that, like Sam was saying, that it's also not just one type of people out there, that this is basically attracted all types of people, good or bad, but you know, all types of people people out here to this fight and it's worldwide and so like I was watching the news today and the Shah of Iran 
was putting out statements talking about you talking about human rights on us, and apparently, um, uh, what do you say, George Ford is not a human in America. And like, wait, hold on, hold on. It wasn't the shot, the shot, the shotgun. Oh, okay, excuse me. It was the Supreme Leader, the Ayatollah, the Supreme Leader. Thank you for that correction. And so that type of stuff, the civil unrest is the only way, in my opinion, that we can get the right people to come to the side that needs to be helped. Uh, if we're just, let's just say, let's just put it as an example. If Colin Kaepernick and Eric Reed are the only ones fighting for social justice in the NFL. Not too many people are going to hear about it, and not too many people are going to just rock with it. But if Tom Brady and Matt Ryan and J.J. Watt say that there is an actual problem, that reaches more people. J.J. Watt has a million people on Instagram that he's reaching, you know what I'm saying, on Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter. All this other time, Brady has millions of people. The same way that the president reaches three million people on his Twitter feed, he, <laughs> what he says, re, it just goes out. Even if it's not right, even if it's wrong, it just goes out and it validates some or it upsets some. And the social protest is how those who have a hundred thousand followers can make it so that a million people are seeing this. And when that many people are seeing an injustice, it's very hard for the majority to just rock with that injustice. Because believe it or not, you're inherently not evil. You're inherently not trying to be wrong as a human being, in my opinion. And so when you see things that are wrong and that large, or that many people see things that are wrong, it's easier for them to call that out and to recognize it as wrong as opposed to a small part of a population seeing it's wrong, you can easily brush that under the, the rug. Well, uh, I mean, I agree with, with both of y'all's um, opinions. Yes, it's symbolism, but it needs to be a focused symbolism. What really rocked me in the protest and I mean, you know me. I'm the I'm the crazy one out the group. If you are, what rocked me was seeing that precinct on fire. That right there put a lot of antennas up. It didn't matter who it was. They let it happen. That that right there shows that it doesn't matter. People are about to. People are. They're finally gotten both boots boots on. If the ultimate sacrifice has to come, it has to come. Because they were willing to actually bomb the authority. And it had them on so alert that they were now lining and fortifying <laughs> their post. <laughs> they could only go from the backside. They weren't even letting people, if anything could happen, come in the front to the plane. So everybody was put on risk. They had people, it had every police officer ever, it, over the whole 50 states lined up in, some, in, in front of something they thought was important. They weren't just in front of protesters. They were in front of something to where they, where they felt safe. They said it's definitely. And like Sam said, yeah, if... We have children. Yes, we don't want. We want them to be able to verbalize uh, and express what this was uh, upsetting them. But again, like I said, all our leaders, all our leaders, be it Fred Hampton, MLK, JFK. Malcolm, all these people did peaceful things. And where are they? Assassinated. So, history shows us that that ain't the way to go. People don't listen. And if you want to get religious, Jesus was, Jesus was uh, peaceful. What happened to him? 
Mm-hmm. It was one of the biggest rebellions in, in, in history. All these people, 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 people died, were killed. But And that's also, the, it conflicts me too, because y'all yeah, have always heard me say it. Everybody calls for a revolution, but really nobody wants a revolution. Because in a revolution, somebody got to go. Somebody important has to go. And it sucks, but that's the ultimate sacrifice of, of a revolution. American Revolution. First person to go was Christmas Atkins. That jumped it all off, a black man. You know what I'm right, saying? Right. Christmas. Christmas. Oh, Christmas. That was, that, that was <laughs> man, man, Christmas, man. You might have to go. Christmas. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, my dad used to say they pushed In South Africa, the apartheid revolution, a lot of people had to go. Yeah. And the thing is that. Yeah, it's symbolism, but it's also, like y'all touched on it, it's fear, too. Because they know what they've done. Mm -hmm. They know the wrongs that they've done throughout the whole American history. From our our official record of us being involuntarily brought to this, this country, 1619, they know all the wrongs they've done. And you know what they're scared of? Retribution. Uh, it right back to them. They're afraid of retribution. That's what it's always been. That's what the suppression. Yeah, that, and that's why they go was. hard on us. That's why they go hard on us. They they want to keep us so far down that they're scared. They're scared that when we finally get everything together, it's going. They're they're scared like oh snaps, karma is really about to bite us in the ass. That's yeah. what Jimmy the Greek said. He said if we let him be coaches, what are we gonna do? Yeah, he did, he, did, he did say that. I saw a political cartoon today, and it's funny that you bring that up about if you look at the institution of the police, the institution of the police was actually started around the time, around the emancipation of the slaves. Yes, it was. It was started to keep us in check, okay, uh, because of the fear of, hey, we don't want these guys feeling like, you know, they have the same rights as us. You know, that's going to be a problem. Uh, my dad always says, too, man, a lot of times white folks only understand three things. Money, power, and violence. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for, for the longest, I was like, yeah, that don't sound right. But as I now sit as a 37, God willing, 38-year-old man, yeah, that's true. I tell you, I was... I had a buddy of mine that lives out in uh, Phoenix, and he lives in Scottsdale. And they 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 tow up Fashion Square, and folks were nervous. They went through and tow up Fashion Square. And I said, what's different about this, because I've been seeing, well, it doesn't make any sense to burn down your own communities. And we're not burning down our own communities. They're going where the, where the, the, the richer parts. Exactly. You know, they finally got it right. Yeah, they <laughs> Hey, we're not we're not tearing our shit up, you know. Uh, but again, it's just those people that had those boutiques in the ritzy part. To, to to y'all, 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 y'all collateral damage. Yeah, tore it up. And like I told folks, man, I said I don't give a damn about no buildings. You can always, if you got insurance, that shit can be rebuilt. You gonna come up? Have y'all wasn't selling shit anyhow, so it's a come up. Okay, mm-hmm. but you can't bring back a life. And so, uh, it's it's. It's gotten to this point where man is boiled over, and the fact that, again, Dara, getting back to your point about the symbolism and just the, the social pressure, you look at it, man. America prides itself on being the, being the number one superpower in the world. Okay, but I, I do a lot of business, and I travel back and forth to Canada. We make fun of Canadians, but really and truly, man, they have great race relations. If you ask a Canadian or anyone else in the world where they're from. Let's just say you're out on an island. You'll be like, hey, man, what are you? You know what they're going to say? I'm German. I'm Canadian. I'm Mexican. You ask us, we're going to identify by race. Shit, I'm black. 
Oh, oh you, what, what country I'm from? Oh, I'm American. You know what I'm saying? It's just how it is. But I look at how Canada handles things. You know, they've gotten rid of guns. Now, they still get guns smuggled in because they're so close to, to New York. They're so close to Buffalo. So shit just comes across. Hell, Windsor is a suburb of Detroit. So, you know, you get a couple guns across. But they don't really be having all that shit. You know, it's just a way, and the police are cool there. Like, they ain't really just busting your head wide open. But the fact that this shit has made not national headlines, world headlines. They're protesting in Germany. They're protesting in Switzerland. They're protesting in South Africa. They're protesting in Paris. I mean, they're protesting in goddamn Germany. And it's just like, wow. You know? I'm a third ward man. You, you know what I'm saying? So it, it's, it's gotten to the point now where the social pressure is making us look bad. So now some shit has to change. Because again, can't go. Ramon, you got something? Because I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain why I asked that. You got something? No, no, no. Okay. The reason, cause, well, the reason I asked is because um, you know, it's real easy when, when, when tensions are high and emotions are high. Yeah, ooh, let's go out and let's show we outrage. Right? But then when things finally blow over, it's what's next. So which would, I guess what I'm asking is, I, I, I guess really your preference and then asking uh, 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 how do you feel, which, which is more impactful to, to organize, to, to develop a process, process and organization to where you can really move or to sit out there and make a whole bunch of noise and fuss. And when it's all said and done, nothing really has been done there. You have shown a symbol of, 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 of being upset or you shown a symbol that you don't agree with what happened. But which one is more impactful? To do process and organization and truly make things move or to sit out there and scream and holler, make a bunch of noise? Well, let me let me go real quick. Um, I agree with that wholeheartedly. If all we're doing is marching in the streets and then you're going home and in November you do nothing, then this is pointless. It straight up was pointless. You got your TV time. You let people know you were upset, but you did not invoke change. Um, the 60s did their marching. They did their chanting. They did all this. And then what they ended up doing was doing the financial boycott. When they did the financial boycott, that is what caused things to change. Yeah. Once they did the financial boycott, they were able to go sit at the table. They were able to go get certain important things um, up to Lyndon Johnson, up to JFK. Otherwise, this stuff would not have made it there. Lyndon Johnson is a known racist, but he had so much social pressure against him that he had to do something that, that mentally and, and spiritually he was against. He was a known racist from Texas. He was not for all that. But he had to do it because he knew the Republic needed it and there was enough social pressure against it. So the way I see it is, yeah, we need to march all the way up until November. And then in November, the same people, the same 60,000 people that showed up in Houston on one day, they need to show up on November whatever 3rd and vote. And they need to vote the correct way. And all over the country, this type of thing needs to occur. But without the civil unrest, I don't think the people who need to see this issue, the people who can physically make the change as of now, they won't even see it. Or if they do see it, they won't respond to it because of the lack of pressure. So I think you need them both. You've got to be out there putting people in the streets Burn it shit down if that's what it calls for. And then you also need to be able to go and do your legitimate things, like go to the ballot box, register these people, these 60,000 people, and things like that. I, I would say, to answer your, your question, if I had to choose between the two, I would say to organize and strategize is probably more important. But I think they go hand in hand. You first have to get people's attention. Once you have their attention, and while you're keeping their attention, then you organize and strategize. That should be going on simultaneously. And I believe, like the just said, 
and, I, and it kind of goes back to what I talked about earlier, you have to make them feel an economical impact. You have to impact them some type of way. That's the way change is going to come about. That and voting. Okay, getting the people in that are going to represent the change that you want. Okay, uh, but if I again, if I had to choose between the two, yeah, organize and strategize. You know, that's that's the right thing because just marching and protesting, like you said, that's cool, but that doesn't accomplish anything. They go hand in hand. You you can't have one without the other. Yeah, yeah, and. and, and I think it happened at a good time. It has happened at other times because mm-hmm. people are uncomfortable. And mm-hmm. when we were talking earlier on the group chat, remember, and we were talking about the civil rights movement and why all that ended, and my whole thing, all, I don't think it was point tell pro or people getting killed. They gave Negroes government jobs. And cats got jobs, bought houses, and got comfortable. They let you send your kid to Lanier on the M&M transfer. <laughs> you were good and comfortable at that point. Shout and out to the Yeah, right, right, word up. We're children oh, that. Oh, but, wow. <laughs> but people are uncomfortable now. So that's where the unrest came. Now, the thing is, if we go back into being comfortable, how comfortable are we going to be? So let me interrupt real quick. Um, uh, you think if it wasn't for COVID, this would not have occurred at all? Uh, no, it would have. I, let me answer because that, that's, that's where I was going to come in. This happened at a perfect, the perfect storm. The reason why, because this has happened before, but everybody can salt it away. They, I got to go back to work. I got to. Athletes, I gotta, I gotta go prepare for a game. I gotta, you know, people can can kind of push it out the way a little bit. You ain't got you shit. Ain't got to go nowhere now. You gotta sit your ass at home, what? watch the news, and watch what happens. You can't even go outside to get a beer because you, you can't go to the gym. So now you have to watch people get murdered. Now that hits you a different way. Now that hits you a different way. Now, uh, it kind of it, it's a it's a catch twenty two now. Is after we just wild for two uh, what a week two weeks? This COVID thing hadn't left yet. So, so I'm expecting the numbers to go up. Oh yeah, and skyrocket. And the tactics that and the tactics that the police were were using also is crazy because they were spraying pepper spray or or tear gas, something that affects your respiratory. Which, if you get hit by it, you gotta take. You're trying to take off your mask to breathe. And it was indiscriminate as well. And who knows what that next person? <laughs> who knows what that next person? A who's trying to help you, or B who who attacked you, has because these per- people weren't getting hit with tear gas from far away. They were getting hit with tear gas point blank range. And then I forgot that one can he took seventy people in his house. Because they was getting tear gas, 70 people, you know he got corona now. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, man, you got that wrong. Oh, man. So it had to be set up, but also the corona and, but you saw how uncomfortable they were with corona. Mm -hmm. They wanted to impose going back to work. First off, who, who wants to go back to work? <laughs> Whoever wants to go back to work? We always complain about work. Why do all of a sudden now we want to go back to work? That's why it's called work, because you don't want to do it. <laughs> I mean, but no, but you saw it. And, and it was because of the financial bind some of these rich people were, are now being put in. Mm. Yes, they're not, they weren't really losing money. 
No, no, nah, they losing money. Nah, nah, they're, no, not. they're just not making money. That's yeah, the they're not making money. They weren't really. You can't lose money on stuff that's not moving. But if you still have fixed bills and fixed income yeah. that you're still having but to pay out, you're not ready to do anything. You're losing money. They they have enough money to pay their bills. They weren't hurt. Yeah, but but a lot of those companies, uh, either their their lease, their mortgages were being suspended, or a lot of them are they, do. First, they got that first batch of the PPP. You know exactly. that's 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 right. And hey, and guess what? I'm gonna tell you like the business tell me. Better find something different. You better find, better find your ways. Your find your way. So why won't you give it a credit though? That ain't got nothing to do with me. Yo, yo, yo. Why won't you save it? Why didn't you have so much debt? Exactly. The business is that. Why do you have so much debt? Anyway, bye 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 bye. Bye. Good night, dude. Right, Garrison. So, and that and that, I mean, yeah, I, I kind of have a cold heart on a lot of stuff. I also have a warm heart on a lot of stuff. But the way it made people feel so uncomfortable, and the way it it that it forced people to watch it was a perfect storm. You know what I'm saying? Because what two weeks, two weeks before this even happened, there were in Michigan, the state right next door, they had armed people going up to the what? Capitol. Storm begging, begging, to to begging to be served. They they were protesting to be served. Exactly. And then now, two weeks later. You kill a black man, and we storm up there now. We trying to storm up there, and you ain't letting us get there. And we ain't got no gun. But you know what I heard, though, just to interrupt real briefly, is that that's why. Is that you're a police man, and you see 200 people, 50 of which have an AR, and the rest of the 150 have a handgun, and then you see 60,000 people, and you've got three ARs, and you've got 50 handguns, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot more confidence that you can have in being violent, in being more aggressive to that group as opposed to the group that is literally, one, all white, so you know that you can't get away with it in the first place, and two, has the firepower that can not only match you, that will probably go above and beyond what you have. They can't really match them. So let them, let them in the... Let them impose those those tanks, those fifty <laughs> cows. You can't bring yeah, tanks. Well, yeah. You can't bring tanks. Because the thing is, they have empathy for those other people. They don't have empathy I mean, for. Yes, um, I mean, yes, I, I understand the emotion, but I'm just saying the optics of it. Yeah. The optics of it, the symbolism of it, just like the symbolism of this this red, white, red, white, and blue and star striped uh, flag we have every time it's waved. It's a symbolism of something. So we need to get to Drew Brees too. Who that? Who that? Uh, it, well, look, I got to, I hear my child still cutting up, so I'm like, no, 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 hey, I, I was just going to say, I know it's getting late, man, yeah. and I appreciate yeah. you coming on the show, brother. Um, So what I was getting ready to say to wrap it up, because you know you are more than welcome to come on at any time. I said we're we going to end up making this a series, man, because, like I said, I this started because, I'm telling you, I, I felt like I needed a support group because I, I truly was losing my mind, man. I was losing my mind and a lot of and, and while I was sitting there trying to figure out what to do next, I was like, Well one thing I certainly know I can do is because I, I've come to the realization that a lot of the fascism or the discrimination or the bias, whatever you want to call it, it stems from like we, we touched on earlier, the stimuli showing that all blacks are inherently criminal. And so because they feel like we're all inherently criminal, whether it's subconsciously or whatever, they respond the way that they, they respond to us and that they don't equate us to being human. They dehumanize us. And so what I wanted to do was, again, because I know so many brothers and sisters who are leaders in their communities and who are doing such positive things, 
I said, what I'm going to start doing is highlighting that so that we can take back our human element. And not only that, but we can educate each other, we can educate our followers, we can educate our children, we can educate each other while we're doing this, man. So before we get out of here, I just want y'all to go ahead and just give your, your, your national say as far as what you want people to do. What you want people to do. Uh, um, more, or, I mean, what, I mean just whatever you want to leave us with, what you guys feel, how you how you want this, this situation to plan out. And Sam, before you get out of here, make sure you tell everybody how they can get in touch with you, your social media platforms and, and your whatever. Because you have quite an interesting Facebook page. I enjoy your press conferences very much, Coach. And uh, I find it highly entertainable. You're one of the most outspoken yeah, brothers out there. Crazy. <laughs> so make sure you give the people that. And so before we get out of here, man, I guess we can do it the same way, go in a circle. Just lead the people with what you want to come out of this situation. Well, what I want to come out of this situation is really just education. Education. We're, we're, we're here in America. Here we are, you know what I'm saying? It now it doesn't it it's 2020. We should be able we have Google. We have digital resources. Everybody should know at least a little bit of everybody's history and what they've gone through. There shouldn't be a single person in 2020 not knowing what's happening in a country that they live in with somebody else. Yep. You know and, I'm, uh -huh. and that's and and really that's it. It's really the ignorance that, like we say, the bubble that some people have been walking in, the tunnel vision that they've been walking in, has now come to light. And now the younger people have picked it up, but we still need these younger people to be educated on everything. They don't have to be masters at everything, but they just need to be educated on everything that's important, especially important to them. And also learn how they learn manners and learn how to maneuver in certain things. Not everything has to be opposition. I mean, we learned this as old. Yes, we were young and rebellious at times, but as older men now, we learned that choose your battles wisely and just make it home. And that's really it. That I that I that I want people to get out of this. Yeah, mine is simple, and I'm going off of yours too. But I got another E word: engagement. People mm -hmm. need to be engaged, engaged in their society, engaged in their communities. And to piggyback off of your education, I was thinking about it the other day. We all got experience homeschooling now. <laughs> I know I do. I had to do it since spring break. So there's no <laughs> excuse for you not educating your own children, teaching them what they need to know. You can do it in the home. All right? So just engage. Teach your children to be engaged. Well, I would say I would piggyback off of Mod and say the same thing, ed engagement, education. My thing is that I come from a two-parent household, and a lot of the things that they taught me when I was growing up were things that I needed to survive in America, and I'm grateful for that. But I also wish they would have taught me a little more of our history and the contemporary history that they went through and the history before that because learning where you come from and the things that you've already accomplished as a people, as a family, as a network is empowering and it also brings you together. And so my takeaway would be to just make sure you educate not just your kids but your grandkids your, your other kids that don't have the father figures or the mother figures or whoever figures to educate them in that process, but that are still in your network, that are still in your culture, I would just say 
Make sure that you instill in them what they need to learn to make it home and then also where they've come from. Because America will tell you you're a second-class citizen in every shape, form, and fashion, and that is further, they can't be further from the truth. And as long as you are just being told you need to do this, this, and this to comply and make it home, you're going to just basically feel like you are a, not necessarily a second-class citizen, but at least subservient because you have to change the person that you are in order to comply with the powers to make it to make it home or to make it however you need to make it. So my thing would be teach them that. That's very important because if you're dead, you can't do nothing. But also teach them where they come from, that they're kings, that they have done very, very important things. People that look like you, people that have your same blood have changed the world already and that you have the same ability and time and effort is all that you need to put into it. Well, all that is all that is awesome, man. Um, I would say this: we have their attention now. Don't waste it. Engage, be a part, and don't waste it. There are things that are coming up. Uh, there are elections that are very important. In fact, I think the primary here in Texas is going to be July 14th, last date to register. It's June 15th, so we need to make sure we take advantage of that. We have their attention now. Don't waste it. That's all I want to say. Make sure you plug yourself. Oh, oh uh, yeah, man. I, again, you know, y'all check me out on IG, A-T-T-Y-S-L-M-2. Uh, I'm on Twitter now. Uh, I've been taking part in that. I don't really, I think I'm just at Millage Law on Twitter. And then on Facebook, man, Sam Millers II, the, the Millers Law Firm, man, we are, I, I didn't go out highly publicizing or anything like that. I think some folks are doing it for clout. But, you know, man, if you get arrested during these protests, uh, you know, uh, we're screening cases, and I'm taking a lot of the cases pro bono, so you can call 713-812-1409. Uh, somebody there will answer. Um you know, and again, we got y'all's attention. Don't waste it. Man, I appreciate that, man, and I appreciate you, brothers. Y'all don't understand. Y'all have helped me a great deal, man. I, I, um, I really was sitting in here trying to figure out, because, again, I, I, I'm trying, I'm plotting. I'm trying to figure out ways to mobilize. I'm trying to figure ways to strategize, and I know that as long as I got brothers like you around me, surrounding me, I know that we can put our heads together and we can come up with something great, man. So, Sam, I appreciate you, man. And, of course, Tribe, y'all know I love you boys doing it. Man, mm-hmm. it's been a pleasure. And y'all have a wonderful night, and I holler at y'all. All right. All right. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Let's do this yeah. right way. You've been listening to the Garage Apartment, man. This is there our, you go. our, our favorite people edition of the Garage Apartment, man. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, our website, the garage, man. Always, man, y'all be blessed. You can't be good. What is what else? I ain't been, I ain't been in a while, man. I ain't got no rest. What I said, be blessed. Be good. If you can't be good, then be good at it, man. Till the next time, we'll holler at y'all. Holler. Follow the Garage Apartment on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Tweet, photo, video. Let me shoot some real quick. Follow me on social media. And subscribe to the Garage Apartment Radio on YouTube.